Good afternoon, everyone, to those of you who are online. I'm just going to make Vicky the host, Victoria, sorry, so we can get started. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Can we just get you set up? Have a little play with this and make sure that you've got everything that you need to do. Okay, so you should be spotlighted on everyone's page now. All right, so I'll just do a brief introduction for those um, for the attendees and then we'll hand straight over to you. Thank you. Uh, so hello everyone and thank you for being here today. Um, this is our week of inspiration, which we're hosting instead of the Salon Cornwall event that we would normally do, um, which would be in person with demos and um, exhibitions and stuff. So instead of that this year, we've gone virtual. And we've got these great um, webinars, live sessions, video content blogs um, that's all being posted over on the um, our Facebook page, which is the um, Professional Hair and Beauty with Truro and Penwith College. Um, so just to say as well, this, um, this week of content is part of Hospitality Table Cornwall, which is um, uh, an ESF funded project through uh, Truro and Penwith College. And we provide um, fully funded courses and events for the hospitality, hair, beauty and complementary therapy industries in Cornwall. And um, we are recording this session. So along with all the other videos that we've got this week, this will be going up onto our YouTube channel later on this week. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Feel free to ask any questions. We've got the chat box going on. We've got a Q&A function. Um, so now I'm just going to mute myself and pass over to Victoria. Thank you. So today's little mini lecture really heavily relies on obviously me doing my little bit of tutorial, but absolutely questions from you because just talking to an empty room it is never it's not the best thing because I can't see the things that you already know that you're interested in or what you struggle with or just any queries you have. So there's no point in me just talking blindly for an hour. And then you think, oh, no, all this, this has been a complete waste of my time. Please use me for my experience. So if you have any questions, if I can, hopefully, I think I'll be able to see them pop up. Otherwise, Nikki, will you just sort of jump in maybe and voice them? I can only see myself on the screen. So if anyone's oh, nodding yeah. or agreeing with me. <laughs> yes, I can see all of the chat box. So, uh, yeah, I'll be able to. Uh... Great. So I don't know if you know what we're doing today. Let me get my hair out of the way. But I thought I would. Firstly, come on with no makeup. So you're welcome because I feel awful right now, but this is me with no makeup. And I thought we'd just start from the real basics. So what I find when I do lecture at different universities around the UK is that, oh, well, thanks very much, um, is that there is, in a college course, you're being taught a lot of different avenues of makeup. And in my second lecture at 3 p.m., I'm gonna sort of go more deeply into different avenues you can go down as a makeup artist in terms of career. But I do appreciate at college level, you're sort of given a little bit of everything. So it sounds really bad, but a bit like a jack of all trades and a master of none. So you're just kind of doing a bit of prosthetics, you're doing a bit of beauty, you're doing a bit of editorial, there's a bit of hair there. And all of those things are really important because you do want to know that oh I absolutely hate wig making I hate knotting moustaches but I really love doing a really amazing eye and great lashes and that's good because you can go from there for you know your future training or assisting whatever way you want to go down and really like focus on those topics topic topics but what I am also seeing is that the very basic levels of makeup and what will get you out there earning money ASAP aren't always covered in maybe as enough depth as need be. I think there's also a real problem in more provincial colleges where there's a lot of white students and then mixed race and black students are really a low number. So therefore you're practicing on white skin, on very young skin, you know, I, I'm guessing most people in the college course are maybe under 25. So in theory, your skin is wonderful. If not, you know, a few blemishes and all the things that we normally struggle with. But it just means that the sort of like the overall being able just to just have a really great knowledge of skin wear and skincare 
it just can't be as broad as it should be. Now, the way to get around that, obviously, is to practice on friends and family. I appreciate in the last year, not been so easy. Um, and to get out there and to assist, even just to assist on weddings. And I know weddings are kind of maybe sort of look, I find I'm quite looked down upon when I say I do weddings as well as working in TV. And, and especially when I work in fashion, no one knows I do weddings. But the brilliant thing about weddings is that you've got gran, mother, bridesmaids, bride, black, white, Asian, whatever skin it could be, any age. And that is a really great mix of people to work on. And the basic, basic thing you need to know, first of all, is good skin wear or what we wear on our skin to make us look flawless. So that's what I'm basically going to do today is a really good skin, really good gloss bright shiny skin which isn't necessarily what I do in tv but I think it's what looks best on most ages and a bit of a like sort of classic kind of smoky eye again please tell me if you know any of this pop up on the messages say why are you doing it this way what's the difference between this and this because me talking for an hour is not going to be fun for anyone especially if you already know it so anyway so let's get going so the most important thing when you approach a face, someone's skin, man or male or female, any age, is you sort of just pick it apart. You have a little look and think, hmm, okay, so there's a few blemishes. Now at the moment, as you can see, I've got, well, I'm a nightmare because it's kind of a spot under the skin. And then I go in and I make it 10,000 times worse. So don't do as I do, do as I say. Spots here. I've got a lot of discoloration on my chin. I don't know if you can see, I don't know if this light is good enough, but like I've got these sort of like age sun spots here. They get much more common as you get older. Um, obviously extreme, well, I think extremely dark under my eyes and other like sort of like mothly skin around here. So my skin from here, from this view, I think it looks fairly good. I'm gonna be 36 on the 13th of March. I've never had anything done to my face or my skin. I've always worn SPF. I've never been in the sun, not never. I mean, I have, but I really try to avoid the sun. I wear a lot of hats or sunglasses and I hydrate my skin hugely. So the first thing I'm gonna look at, and obviously I'm doing it on myself, so it's not a very great demonstration, but it's all we can do right now, is that, okay, I haven't got too many lines, that's fine. you know. So I don't have to maybe worry about that much hydration. I do definitely need to put a bit of oomph into my skin to brighten it a little bit. And I do need coverage on the spots, I need coverage under my eyes. So I'm instantly thinking, okay, this person, i.e. me, hasn't got too many lines, so I can get away with a slightly heavier coverage under my eyes, which will help me get rid of those dark circles. If I was working on someone in their 50s, 60s, whatever it might be, and they do have slightly more lines and the skin is a little bit crepier, I'd be thinking, all right, I do need a little bit of coverage, but I'm not gonna go too heavy because I don't want it to sit in the lines. That's another little stage later on, but let's get into the skincare I'm putting on. Now, every single day I put on a serum. So the first thing you put on your face is a serum. That will always, I'm just seeing if I've got one here. I've already got it on, so should I do it again? I'm not gonna put it on again because I don't want to like roll or like get too heavy because I have got a serum on because obviously I've worked out and I showered and put my stuff on. But in theory, I'd put on a serum first. Now, that serum has to be extreme light and fine. All serums generally are that consistency. And the reason the serum goes first is because the lighter the product, not in color, but in weight, in density, it goes first. So it goes serum, eye cream, moisturizer, SPF. So as the thicker the products go on, that's when they go on their skin. So serum first, now the one I use at the moment is a vitamin C serum. The reason I'm using vitamin C is because it's very good for brightening in the skin. So to get rid of these little, little pigmentation marks, they haven't made a massive change yet, but you know, we're sticking in in there and it really helps to hydrate and plump the skin. I might also use a hyaluronic acid serum again to plump and hydrate the skin. The best thing you can do, I think, as a student of makeup or beauty is to be getting on YouTube, not watching anyone like James Charles. Don't watch any of like the big, famous Nikki tutorials. I mean, do watch them because they're really interesting. But you actually want to go and look at the skincare experts on there. You want to go and look at people who really know what they're talking about in terms of what skincare to use as a base for makeup. So 
and I'm not going to think of anyone off the top of my head now. No, so for maybe a younger crowd, I know Hiram, he's a Hawaiian vlogger, very, very good on his skincare, very good for talking about skincare and younger skins, because I do think that's sometimes missed because you should be starting your skincare as young as possible. But I do appreciate that you're not going to be spending lots of money on serums and all these different things, maybe until a few years down the line, but obviously the sooner you look after your skin, the better. Although the most important thing anyone could do if you want to spend no money to at all is just put SPF on. SPF and a five pound simple moisturizer. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, who could you look at? Um, I might have to put this in a different, or maybe pop this on my Facebook or something at some point to bring up some names because they've instantly lost, left my head. And I just can't think of them right now, but just have a really good look on YouTube for skincare tutorials. I'm really soaking what they're saying. If you're not sure what hyaluronic acid is, research it. If you don't know what niacinamide is, research it. If you don't know what vitamin C esters are, research it. As soon as you start to know what they are, you'll start looking at them and the back of what we call the inky lift list, which is all the ingredients on the back of your brands. And you'll be able to pick your what you want to buy and what you want to put on yourself or your client's faces by being able to read the back. And also that way you'll know that if you've got a 16 pound product and a five pound product, if the back says the same thing, buy the five pound product because I can promise you the 60 pound one, you're just paying for the name and the packaging. Anyway, so the first things are the skin. So like I say, I've already put my serum on, but I'm gonna go and put on a little bit of moisturizer now because I want this to be a really glossy, dewy skin and any foundation you put on always applies so much more beautifully over your face when you've got a bit of slip, so a little bit of moisture underneath. I'm gonna use some Madara, SOS Rich Barrier Seeker Cream, and it's for very dry, stressed skin. Now, my skin might not look dry, but it's very thirsty. I can put on layers and layers and layers of product, and it, they just soak in, and that's fine for me. If you come across someone who has extremely greasy skin, very oily skin, maybe prone to acne, you want to be look, thinking about just using the serum and maybe not going in with a moisturizer as well because it might be just a little bit too much grease for the skin if you're about to put makeup on. That said, if you do suffer with acne or very oily skin, the thing you should be doing is moisturizing because the reason the skin is producing oil is because it's desperate. It needs something there to hydrate it. So by trying to avoid creams, it's only gonna overproduce more oil, more sebum. So actually you're doing the right thing by putting some moisturizer on. Just um, now, a question uh, popped up. Um, Nikki's asked, how long would you usually wait before applying makeup after you've put your skincare on? So do you need to wait for it to kind of sink in completely or like you were saying, you want that bit of slip? Yeah, I mean, ideally you would wait maybe five minutes. I don't have that luxury of time when I'm working on clients. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I would just put on a sort of not a huge amount and really try and press it into the skin and let it sink in. One thing you could do in TV, especially and in fashion, you have, and with celebs as well, you have to do hair and makeup. You can't just be a makeup artist or just a hairstylist. So I would maybe do the skincare, pop them, you know, go over to the hair, do a blow dry, put their hair in rollers, whatever I need to do, and then go back to the skin. Oh, so, yeah. So listen, I now have put loads of cream on my face by, by this point, and there's a bit of shine, and I want that moisture in there. I want it working, but I want to take away a bit of that shine. So I'm going to go in with it pore and shine control primer there's a few different primers that are really important if you want a skin that is a dewy glossy skin look for a primer that looks like a moisturizer that's white and then it's kind of slippery and that it rubs in just like a moisturizer I mean obviously you'd probably be doing this maybe with a buffing brush at this point I'm doing it with my fingers because I can I mean, there are times um, when I did use my hands to, well, I would use my hands to moisturize into skin for clients. I don't know what's gonna happen with that from now on in, in these times. Um, the other primer that you're gonna find is a primer that's kind of a clear silicone based primer that when you squeeze it on your hand, it squeezes out clear. And it, when you rub it, it almost turns to like a velvet effect. And that's a great for blurring the skin if there's fine lines, if there's a huge amount of shine. And the great thing about it being clear is that you can use it on black skin, brown skin, you can use it on men. No one knows there's makeup on there, but it will take away the extra shine. So really concentrate on knowing that a primer should be white and like a moisturizer or clear. One is to really hydrate, to absorb into the skin and take away a bit of shine, but to help with pores. And the other one is kind of just to glide over the skin and like sort of um, 
create like a velvety base that just takes away any shine and blurs everything away. So those two things are on now. And I think my skin is looking like it's got a bit of hydration. You can see a bit of glow there, but I want it to be even brighter, which is why I'm gonna go in with a highlighting product now. So I, and I think most makeup artists in this day and age have a bit of a problem with highlighters because we're seeing powder highlighters used daily on every skin at any age and all over the face. And that is a real problem because highlighter, the clue in the title is highlight. You are drawing attention to parts of the face that you might want to recede. So fine lines around the eyes, bumps, spots. By sweeping a powder highlighter over there with a big brush, you're just going boop, 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 look at me. It is the worst thing. And also the reason we hate them is because they just look so cakey because people put their foundation on, put their concealer on, put the powder on, then they bake. No one bakes. Baking's not a thing in the real world. Then they, and unless maybe you're in the only way as Essex and 21. That's the only time you're going to get away with that. But then they do that. And then there's a load of powder highlighter on top. And you're just looking at this cakey, dry and heavy skin. It does nothing for anyone. The only time that might be looking really beautiful is if someone's doing a vlog in front of a big ring light and looking gorgeous. If they're on a shoot and they've got a team around them and the, the photographs can be taken there and then, preserved in history, no way would that ever work for everyday life for brides, for me to do a TV show. It's just never gonna be powdery like that. So we look at liquid highlighters. Now, this is my well-loved and very rubbed off um, Charlotte Tilbury Hollywood Flawless Filter. Obviously there's a myriad of liquid highlighters out there. Nan's doing great ones. But the difference between this is that it's almost a foundation and a highlighter in one. Although the foundation al alone wouldn't be enough to actually give you enough coverage. Can you see that sort of there? Light's very bad in here. This, since I've started using it, is pretty much the main thing I use on my skin and on some client's skin. And then I go in with the foundation and then a concealer. And I kind of see what I can take away with this before I have to go in with the other products. If I was doing this for a photo shoot, yes, you could use this highlighter because you have control over the model or the client, like you can position them, you know they're gonna be photographed and you know you can retouch after. If I was using this on TV, it would probably be a big no-no. In fact, a lot of what I'm doing today would be a big no-no because we need skin on TV to be very matte on TV shows, else everyone just looks sweaty and horrible. That said, I might just use it in sporadic places around the face where I really want to jump some highlighter out. But anyway, I'm gonna show you what I do to me. So I'm gonna pop this on the areas does anyone know that the areas that you'd want to highlight that you'd want to push the light away? Mine would always be the tops of my cheekbones. I want the light to be pushing out from there because I want my cheek balloon to look as high and lift as possible. Maybe a tiny bit on the bridge of my nose. I'm gonna pop a little bit in the middle of my forehead. Now that's a bit of a scary one because no one wants to find a shiny forehead. And I do have some lines forming up here. So I don't want to highlight those. So I've stopped before I've reached that line. I'm also gonna take this into my inner eye and underneath my eye. Now, I can do this because I haven't got a huge amount of lines underneath my eyes. Putting a highlighter too much underneath the eyes if you've got any creepiness can be a little bit tricky. I'm also gonna put a tiny bit on my chin. Now, just by doing that, you can see that I'm pushing light in certain areas. So the light underneath my eyes is working really well because it's sort of diffusing the darkness away and pushing light underneath there. The light on my cheekbones is working really well, a bit on my nose and my chin. So these bits are coming forward and anything that I haven't highlighted is hopefully going back. Now I'm gonna buff that in. I'm gonna use a very dense buffing brush, not a foundation, but, well, this is a, can be a foundation brush, brush, but traditionally you would think a foundation brush is this sort of flat. Yes, Cupid's bows, but that's a great point. The only reason I haven't put it on my Cupid's bow now is because that's sort of like an after, touch because I know I'm going to put in so much around it that it might get kind of blurred away. But yeah, Cupid's Bow is a great place. So I'm going to buff in with this type of blending brush because I just think I want to move this product around and gloss it over my cheeks, under my eyes. Whereas a foundation brush, a flat one would paint it. It literally would push it down. Well, I don't want to do that. I just want to buff it in and keep it looking 
as light and hydrated and pretty as possible. So I almost want to buff it. So it's buffing into the areas where I haven't applied it. And just almost like it sinks into the skin. So it's just disappeared. So it's given me a lovely glow, but it's just sitting back away. So another version of that would be something like um, these little drops. These are by Madara, but I know, oh God, I'm terrible with brands. I think Becca do these drops, um, Alf. Loads, you find the they come in this little dropper. You can pop them on the back of your hat or on your palette, I should say. And then you'd mix a little bit of cover effects. That was it. They're brilliant ones. Thank you for reminding me. And then mixing those into your um, foundation would also would create the same sort of effect as what I've just used with the Charlotte Tilbury. Be really careful when you're buying high, um, highlighter or highlighting drops. This is obviously a really pale champagne color. Now my skin, I would say, is fairly light. I wonder if I can get any of that onto there. It's fairly light. So I can get away with this. Could you use this on brown skin? No. Could you use this on black skin? No. Equally, could you use a highlighter that's like in a really rich bronzy gold on white skin? Probably not. It would look really weird. So the colour of your highlighter very much applies to the colour of your skin. And that's why I'm starting to see lots of people who look like robots with this like purpley silvery kind of weird stripe down their cheek looks like almost muddy that's because that tone is not right for your skin that's for a cold blue skin it shouldn't be on a warm mediterranean skin or a skin that fake, heavily faked hands so just be really aware of that when you're buying it so i'm going to go in with my foundation now now i'm going to use my makeup forever ultra hd the reason i'm using this is because it gives me great coverage but it's really workable and it will let my skin breathe I don't think I personally need a lot of foundation. I'm not one of those makeup artists who covers the face in foundation first and then sees what like concealing is left needs to be done. I would rather spend more time really working on my concealing and conceal, concealing work than covering my face in a really heavy mask of foundation and then thinking that, oh, it looks different to my neck or it's gonna crease. So I'm gonna use a very tiny amount. I'm gonna mix on the back of my mind, on the back of my hand. Hang on, Megan just wrote a little um, comment, but the bottom of it was lost. I couldn't click onto it. So could someone tell me what Megan said? Uh, so Megan has asked, do you advise products that are high end are better or have you come across any high street brands which are just as good? So no, uh, high end brands are not necessarily any better. And it, each brand of makeup is good for their own things. And if you like it, you like it. High-end brands and high street brands are usually made in the same factory with exactly the same ingredients and then put in slightly higher priced packaging or using the name of Giorgio Armani to sell it for £32, whether where someone like L'Oreal can be sold for £6. I don't use any high street brands purely because the people I'm working with don't want to see it on my on my kit layout, on my flat lay. They need to see expensive brands and well-known brands. That said, the brands I use are usually from makeup houses rather than fashion houses. So I do use Chanel, I do use Giorgio Armani, the foundations, I don't use any Dior, but I very much use brands like NARS, Makeup Forever, a bit of MAC, not loads of Max, to be honest. 